name is Szymon Gostynski. You may call me Simon, because it's just easier. I'm a Polish attorney, but I'm actually also a US licensed attorney. I passed the New York bar exam a while ago. Don't necessarily practice any New York law on an everyday basis, but I do work with either US clients who have some dealings in Poland or some Polish clients who have some legal dealings in the US. We, we were asked to briefly tell you about the situation in Ukraine. Before we move on to the legal issues, I just want to touch upon one issue which is important, I think, the, also the people of Ukraine. It's kind of a history, a historical background too, before we, we move on. The war in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, hasn't started on February 24th. It has started eight years ago. On the night on, uh, from 26th to 27th February 2014, Russian soldiers in unmarked uniforms have marched into the parliament of Crimea and they have raised a Russian, a Russian flag over the building of Crimea's parliament. Then they moved on to occupy other administrative buildings and this is really where Russia's invasion in Ukraine has started. This event was quickly followed by a referendum that was organized in Crimea and after the referendum it was announced that a independent republic of Crimea is being formed which quickly next day signed an accession treaty of Crimea to Russia and that treaty was ratified by the Russian parliament on March 21st. So this was one set of events that have happened over eight years ago now. And the second set of events, which has happened almost parallel in time to that, is the fact that in April 20, 2014, as a result of Russia's military interventions, east part, on the eastern part of Ukraine, two breakaway puppets, quasi-states, have been formed, the Ukrainsk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic. And ever since the fighting was going on. So what happened on Fe February 24th, 2022, is not the beginning of the war, it's just another chapter in a war that has been going on for eight years. Where are we in this? Poland, as you may have heard, has in a sense become a hub for a lot of aid in terms of humanitarian aid and also military aid, also become a shelter for many Ukrainians fleeing from the war. And sort of from history, we turn into a little bit of a geography lesson. Poland is here in the middle, Central Europe, as you can see, it's very central. And we're, our neighbors are Belarus, which has been an important part of the events which are taking place. So sort of on the north, you'll see a little enclave that's Kaliningrad, that's Russia's territory. And of course, all of this is Ukraine. It's very close to where we are, the border with Ukraine. So I kind of marked, this is Krakow, where we are. This is the border. If you look at Google Maps, we were to jump in the car, in two and a half hours, we would be at the border. Rockets have exploded as close as here, 10 miles from the border. It's 266 kilometers, that's 160 miles, it's all highway. And this town, Zeshuv, plays an important role in the support that's going, humanitarian support, also military support, that's going towards the Ukraine. And this is where a lot of US troops are currently located. We have about, I think, 12,000 US soldiers currently in Poland. So it's very close. Obviously, most of the fighting is taking place in the eastern part of Ukraine, 
But as you may have heard in the news, two days ago, a bomb has exploded in the center of Vinnytsia, which is here in a shopping center, and I think 30, over 30 civilians have 30 civilians have died, including children. Pretty much all over Poland these days, but a, l a large portion of them are deployed here because this is an airport. There is a civilian airport with a fairly large landing strip. Currently, you can land there with a regular Ryanair, EasyJet, you know, Polish Airlines jet, but if you land there, you will see Patriot anti-missile and anti-aircraft batteries located at every corner of this airport. This is where most of the huge Globemaster, Jumbo Jets, Hercules airplanes land and deploy military aid, which then crosses the border into various ways into Ukraine. But we also have, I mean, we are not exactly sure how many, the exact number of, of US troops located currently in Poland is what we get from the politicians who, who sometimes say it's 12,000 people, but we don't really know. There are some fighter jets deployed in our base close to Łódź and close to Poznań, but the Polish Air Force operates F-16 fighter planes, and we know that F-18s, F-15 planes have landed, some Apache helicopters have been deployed into Poland, but we also know of British troops that are here because these troops are not only just to make sure that whatever lands here gets safely to where it's supposed to land, but we know that a lot of Ukrainian troops are being trained in Poland, often by US troops, British troops, Polish troops. This is sort of the geography, and actually, um, right after February 24th, we were very worried here what's going to happen, if Poland is going to be next. Actually, I had some, uh, I was about to organize a conference, I did organize a conference in May, but a lot of people, you know, the, orga the people on the board of the organization have called me and said, you know what, Simon, maybe we have to call it off because we don't have many registrations. People don't want to come to Poland, do not want to come to Krakow. Eventually, we got quite a lot of registrations, but it was uh, uh, closer to the May date. And in fact, the streets, the hotels were suddenly empty. You know, I had friends working in the hotels and they're saying, groups are canceling, they're not coming over. But those who came was the first airborne division out of Maryland, and a lot of them landed here in Krakow. And um, in a sense, it was also a psychological effect for all of us because suddenly on the streets of Krakow, you would see US soldiers, almost as tourists. I think they were told on purpose just to make sure that everybody see, here sees them and understands that you know, we, we're holding your back, so to say. And in fact, I know of many people who came over to, say, to them and said, you know, thank you for coming, thank you for being here. So, yeah, I haven't seen them for a few weeks now. I know that uh, the first airborne is now in Zeshov because when President Biden came over to Poland, he has visited them there. And obviously Russia being Russia, when President Biden was here, some rockets have exploded here in Yavorov. So, and all over Ukraine, of course, but just to make sure, what's... No, nah. 20 kilometers is about 12 miles from the border, uh, was the closest that it was reported. Like I said, Poland has become, in many respects, we really tried to show that we're there also to, to really help the people of Ukraine, uh, given the situation. For me personally, I think the mo most important aspect of this help was the fact that uh, Poland has become a shelter for many Ukrainians fleeing from war. And it was mostly women and children who came over to this country. I checked the figure yesterday. From February 24th, 4.8 million people have come, have crossed the border from Ukraine into Poland. And I actually had a similar lecture to this maybe two weeks ago. 
I had to update the figure by 300,000 people from the last time I presented a similar slide. Poland has a population of 38 million people. I think some of you are from California. California has 39 million people. I think we have students from Nebraska. Nebraska has 2 million people. <laughs> so, so two and a half times the population of Nebraska, that's how many people have crossed the border from Ukraine to Poland. Did all of these people stay here? No. On, on February 24th, as it happened, is, it was a huge wave of people that came in. Normally, Ukrainians visiting Poland, have, there was a visa requirement. All of that was abandoned. Everybody who came to that border, as long as, had, as they had any form of identification, they didn't need to have a passport, anything, driver's license, birth certificate, any form of personal ID would work, you, the border guards would let people in. Currently, we're at the number where it's 25 to 30 people, and actually it's roughly about the same people coming in and coming out. Right after February 24th, the number was much higher, and it was much more of a one-way traffic from Ukraine into Poland. One thing to say, because some people might not know this, before February 24th, we had about a million Ukrainians living in Poland. Poland was an attractive place to work, so a lot of people from Ukraine were living in Poland prior to February 24th. A lot of these people were men, and about 400,000 men have left Poland and went to Ukraine to defend their country. So, People who came were women and children mostly, very few men. The traffic that went into Ukraine were mostly Ukrainian men that were living in Poland and were working here. And they came back in order to defend Ukraine. Why did so many people come here? Like I said, already many Ukrainians were living here, so it was very natural because People had friends, family who was already here. Secondly, it was very clear from, from sort of the moment that, that this new chapter in, in the war in Ukraine has, has, has started that the border guard said, we're going to let everybody in. So who wants to come, come. So we are, as a, as a country, we're very welcoming. And then, there are other reasons also. People wanted to be in a safe place, so they crossed the border, but they wanted to remain close to their homes. So people wanted to be able to come back quickly. So they didn't want to go into Germany, Holland, some other countries further in the West. There's also another aspect to this, a language aspect. Even though the Ukrainian language and the Polish language are different languages, we, it's easy for the Ukrainians to learn Polish, and it's not that difficult. I mean, we can, in a sense, understand each other. So, various reasons why a lot of people have come here. It was, of course, a big task to accept such a huge wave of people in such a short span of time. And Poland is not a country that has a lot of experience with dealing with immigration waves. Of course, the government did a lot, organized shelters at the, you know, indoor arenas, schools, places where you normally organize shelters. But it was actually the ordinary people that stepped up, and a lot of people have accepted tall strangers to live with them under one roof. My associate, one of my associates in a law firm, she still lives with two women, four children, they've been living together for 12 strangers, they've been living together for two months, they don't know how much longer they're gonna live together. So, 
there is there there is a lot of people we assess i mean it's assessed that probably around 10% of Poland's population these days is Ukrainian what, what do you think so I travel around the world and people have noted a sharp difference in how the Ukrainian immigrants are into Poland are treated relative to immigrants from other parts of the world. Yes, it's, it, it's, it's obviously controversial. I'm not sure if you remember or how many of you remember about, I'm not sure if it was probably fall last year, where a lot of uh, immigrants from the Middle East stood at the border between Belarus and Poland and tried to cross that border. And the Polish border guards weren't uh, ne nearly as welcoming uh, these days. Of course, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, it was a difficult situation. Why? It's not because you know, we like the Ukrainians and we don't like people from the Middle East, but this whole operation of bringing people from the Middle East was organized by the Lukashenko regime and the Putin regime in order to destabilize the situation in Central Europe, in Poland, and so on. So they actually had planes. Most of these people had Russian and Belarusian visa, tourist visas, were brought over to Belarus and then they were pushed by the Belarusian army to go and cross the border illegally. Poland was very clear. Anybody who wants to cross the border legally, come over. But these people were forced to go in the middle of the forest where the temperature at night would drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, sleep out there and cross the border. So in a sense, it was very difficult <laughs> and a dramatic choice. You know, do we let these people in? But it will only result in the fact that Putin and Lukashenko would just keep coming and bringing more people. The humanitarian aspect of this is, 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 is very difficult because we're not talking about things, we're talking about people. So, yes, these people were more than discouraged from coming in Poland. I mean, the, the, there was literally sort of riot police with shields not allowing people in. And it's, it was a, a difficult situation, and I'm not sure we did the right thing or not. But the situation is that currently there is a huge fence uh, that's uh, put up there. And, and that, it ended really, as I understand, with, for example, in Iraq, I know that people were not allowed to get on planes that are flying in the direction of Minsk, Moscow, and these, pla in the, these, place, these places, and some of the airlines have brought the people back. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a one-way ticket given by the Belarusian and the Russian regime for these people, so. One more important uh, difference is that uh, all those refugees were by the fact refugees but they were trying to get into the EU territory, Polish territory, from another state, not the mother state, not the state of their nationality. So it's a, it's a wider difference that they are already out of their state, but they want to move forward. Ukrainian have, Ukraine has a direct border with Poland, so it's also a, a big formal and political difference. And, and there is also, you may not know this, but, but Poland's border has shifted after the Second World War. So when we look at the map, Poland, Polish map was looking dif different until, uh, until the end of the uh, Second World War. That part of Poland was Germany. And actually the Polish territory has expanded, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Yarema, but probably around this part of Ukraine and into White, uh, Belarus, and then you see Vilno, which is the capital of uh, Lithuania. That was a Polish city until 1945. So, the decision made in Yalta by Stalin was to move Polish borders. So, Polish families were forced to leave this territory and were brought over, a lot of them actually, to this territory that was former Germany. So, if you 
go to Wrocław, which was Breslau, third biggest, I think, city of the Third Reich, a lot of people who are there, who are there their family was from Lviv. So there is also a historical connection to it. And actually, if you looked at the sort of commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania at the end of 17th century, most of this territory up to the Black Sea and up there, was the ter even further, was the territory of Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth. If Putin is saying something about bringing historical borders, Okay, so an important aspect to what Poland was doing from Ukraine is the fact that so many people have come here, have found a safe shelter, and they're here. Another aspect of it is the humanitarian aid that's going into Ukraine, so the logistical aspect of it. And there's also a military equipment aspect to it, which where Poland is an important contributor of military equipment to Ukraine. It was announced a few days ago, and again, we don't never know the details until somebody just during a press conference gives out the numbers, so there's no way to actually prove if it's true or not. But a few days ago, our Minister of Defense has visited Kiev and has announced during a press conference with Ukrainian defense minister that the Poland has sent uh, military equipment uh, worth over $1.7 billion into, into Ukraine. Among others, we have sent over 240 tanks at this point, and it looks like we're gonna send another 250 tanks, so close to 500 tanks into Ukraine. And there is a lot of other things that we have sent, uh, not only tanks. And why this was also important, because Polish military had still a lot of former, I mean, it, it was a Soviet bloc country until the end of 1989. So we still had a lot of military equipment dating from the old times. So our tanks, we had 250 T-72 tanks which are used by the Ukrainian military. So they don't need to train. They can use the equipment from day one. So this is why it was important for the Polish army to contribute. There was, in the beginning, you may have heard, I think CNN and other media sources have reported about the Polish fighter jets. We have close to 30 MiG-29s, and there was, I think, too much press rumor about this. But we don't know at the end what happened. I'm not sure if these planes are today flying in Ukraine or not. We don't know. It was yesterday reported, for example, that the Czech Republic, Czechia, sent some helicopters that they had, uh, which again are helicopters which are also used by the Ukrainian Air Force. So they, they don't need to train. A lot of the equipment was already upgraded to NATO standards with a lot of new electronics and, and so on. So that's only the only aspect of training that the Ukrainian military needs to undergo. So in terms of logistics, currently most of military humanitarian aid goes through the territory of Poland. And if you go, uh, I mean, we've already, we also seen that on, a, on the highway ring around Krakow, we saw just trucks loaded with tanks going in the direction of Ukraine. A lot of lands in Zeshov and that's brought, is brought then over the border. Often these are trucks which have no license plates, there are military people inside, but they don't even wear insignia. Uh, so in a sense, it's a reverse story of what Putin did in Crimea in 2014. So you may ask yourself a question, are there any US troops in Ukraine today? Who knows, maybe. I'm pretty certain, at least for training purposes, yes. But is there anything more to it? We don't know. Okay, so this is in terms of a little bit of history, geography, and just where Poland stands as the hub. Since you are lawyers, some of you are law students, let's turn to the sort of legal framework. So a lot of Ukrainians have come into Poland. 
And with that, we had to address a lot of aspects of suddenly having these people just living here with us. So what has happened is our parliament has passed a special bill. Uh, there is a long Polish name of it in parentheses. It's a bill that was passed on March 12. Interestingly enough, it has a rich retroactive effect from, you guessed it, February 24th. Essentially, automatically, without applying for anything, any Ukrainian citizen who has entered the border, who has entered Poland as of February 24th, February 24th and later, with the intention to stay in Poland, was automatically granted a protective status for the next 18 months. For now, it's 18 months. Who knows? Hopefully, we won't have to extend this period. For now, it's 18 months counted from February 24th. What does this mean? These people are allowed to stay here legally. These people are allowed to work here legally. These people are allowed to conduct business activity if, if they were Polish citizens. Ukrainians have also full free access to our healthcare system, educational system. They enjoy all of our social security benefits is, is, as if they were Polish citizens. Sort of the technical aspect to it, how this is done, how do you manifest your intention to stay in Poland? There is something called a PESEL number. This is the equivalent of the uh, US social security number. So it was a special expedited process. People would obtain, you would call it a social security number. And with that social security number, if you go to a hospital and you show, I've got the social security, you will be treated free of charge. Every US, UA citizens can obtain this. This bill has addressed a lot of issues. For example, a lot of people came in cars. Yes, you know, cars need to be inspected every year. What if their inspection is, well, well the, the Polish authority has the right to inspect the cars. How about civil liability, insurance policies, all of that. This bill covers a lot of these areas. Uh, it's got special provisions, for example, for doctors and nurses. Normally, if a Ukrainian, you are a Ukrainian doctor, you cannot practice as a doctor here in Poland. But there was a special expedited process for Ukrainian doctors in order to allow them to practice in Poland, which is also helpful because we suddenly had a lot of people from Ukraine, and it's easier if these people are treated by somebody who does speak the language. Since people were already here, it also allowed them to find you know, a source of income, just work here as a doctor. Same applied for nurses, for academic staff at universities. So if you have a professor of, I don't know, philosophy, his credentials, it allows for Polish universities to recognize these credentials and for continue for these academical staff to also work at Polish universities. This, when do you lose your, these benefits? You lose these benefits if you leave the territory of Poland for longer than one month. Then it is assumed you lost your interest and an intention to stay in Poland. Was this bill perfect? Is this bill perfect? No, <laughs> because it was drafted very quickly overnight in order to address many, many issues. As an example, it, in the beginning, it was changed. It allowed for protective this automatic protective status only to Ukrainian citizens who have crossed the border into Poland from Ukraine into Poland directly. But if somebody has fled from Ukraine going, for example, through Slovakia in order to end up into Poland, because they haven't crossed from the territory of Ukraine, suddenly they didn't fall into this new uh, bill and the new provisions, so that was fixed. Then we generally say, this is for Ukrainian citizens. But what if a Ukrainian citizen, let's say a man, he has to stay because he can't cross the border because generally men between 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave the country. He has to stay, his wife and the children, they're fleeing into Poland, but they don't hold a Ukrainian passport. Maybe they are holding a Russian passport. Makes marriages, they happen. And suddenly we had to find a fix and solution for that situation. There were other aspects to it, for, for it, so suddenly we found sort of different situations where a fix had to be put in place, and some have been put into, put into place, others are not really fixed until now. 
but they're, hopefully they will be fixed. So this is what Poland has done in order to create a legal framework for these people to be here. Important aspect for it is, for example, the work permit. I'm a member of the New York State Bar Association tar Ukrainian Task Force, and for example, in terms of the USA, uh, United States, United States has created a special program to bring Ukrainian people and for, in order for them to enjoy this special protective status so people can come in the US. But the huge problem is a work permit. It takes a huge amount of time to process work permits for these people. In fact, most of these people who have come into the US don't have a work permit in their hand until now. So, the Polish solution, just automatically grant these people a right to work, is probably a better solution to the fact that in the US it has not been done like this. These people need to go and stand in line just like any other applicant, and it takes time. Okay, so that was one aspect of what happened after February 24th, was what done here. The other aspect of what's going on is the fact that a lot of people who have fled from war have probably witnessed things which are important from the perspective of prosecuting war crimes, genocide crimes, crime of illegal aggression. So we knew that from really day one we're gonna have people who should be treated also as witnesses for purposes of prosecuting people responsible for this illegal invasion onto Ukraine. The ICC, and I was told, I think some of you at least have been in Hague. Not sure if you met the president of the ICC. No? From 2021, the president of the ICC is Professor Hofmanski, the first Polish judge of ICC. She a good friend of my father, and Professor Hofmanski is going to be the president of the ICC for until the end of 2024. Who knows, maybe he'll witness already some things happening before the tribunal, before his term lapses. But before the ICC, what has happened is one of the ICC prosecutor, Mr. Karim Khan, has decided to investigate and start in formal proceedings before the ICC in order to investigate alleged crimes against humanity and war crimes. Interestingly enough, not sure if you know this, but either nor Ukraine nor Russia are, have signed the Rome statue of the ICC, so formally are not covered, but Mr. Karim Khan has found a legal solution, legal base, and he found sufficient basis for him to proceed based on some applications made by Ukraine already in 2014 after annexation of Crimea. So the ICC has started an investigation and parallel to this, the Polish public prosecutor, just because we know we have witnesses located in Poland, has opened its own proceedings among others, in order to aid the investigation conducted in Hague by the ICC. I tried to figure out what was the number of witnesses heard by the Polish prosecutors. I couldn't find the current number, but at some point in time, end of March, it was told that they've heard over 300 witnesses in Poland in front of the Polish prosecutor. So this is really conducted mainly in order to present uh, preserve evidence, gather testimonies, maybe photographs, you know, people have cell phones, have photographs in them, maybe movie clips or whatever. So this is all being collected by the Polish prosecutor's office. There's a special tip line, hotline, which you can call, it's in Ukrainian, you can say, I, I've witnessed something, I want to testify, and you're encouraged to do so. In fact, we received letters from our bar association urging us that if we have a, a client, somebody who works into our law office and says, I witnessed something, that we help to bring them in front of a Polish prosecutor in order for them to testify and give their testimony. By the way, yesterday while crossing a border, I've met what had not been done before. Uh, 
like a small notice to every person that if you are if you're considering yourself as a potential witness, please contact and, and the hotline. Yeah. yeah. This is what's being done here in terms of. So there's a formal criminal proceeding run by the Polish prosecutors. In fact, also we have there was a special task force of prosecutors, investigators, uh, investigators from Poland, Ukraine, and Lithuania already created in March in order for them to gather evidence and uh, Polish prosecutors have come into Ukraine in to document many terrible things that have happened. So in terms of what's going on in Poland, I think this gives you an overview of, uh, of the situation and I'm certain actually you're waiting really more to hear what is the actual legal situation in Ukraine itself. So I'm turning it over to uh, my dear friend Yarima. Thank you.